Welcome to the third session of our 2021 conference. My name is William Brooks, and I'm part of the benefits team here at Beehive Insurance. Today's webinar is sponsored by Regents, and we would like to extend our appreciation to them for their continued support and partnership. When we reached out to Regents about this session and what we wanted to share, we were surprised to find that they were actually setting up a webinar about the same topic. So we are going to share a portion of that meeting with you today. The presenters for that meeting are Dr. Amy Kahn, the Executive Medical Director for Regents Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Utah. Her remarks are centered around promoting respiratory health in the workplace. Next, we'll hear from Dr. Hossam Mahmoud, who is the Behavioral Health Director, as well as a board certified psychiatrist. He will be talking about preventing and managing burnout. And finally, we'll be hearing from Raphael Seifner, who holds the Leadership Development Manager position and Cambius Health Solutions Human Resource Team. His remarks are centered on the work experiences of, of the future and post-COVID. I will now turn the time over to them. I want to thank you for all the efforts that you've made through this extraordinary time. We appreciate you and all you do and hopeful that today our comments will continue to be uh, supportive to you as we move through yet another chapter, right, through this unfolding time. Uh, I do want to say that the focus of my comments today is going to be preventing the transmission of respiratory illness in the workforce, in the workplace. And um, I really recognize that many of you have already put in certain uh, adaptations, changes, what have you, and that each of your work settings does vary. I know some of you are in manufacturing, food service, others have more of a traditional office setting. And so I really appreciate that um, you know, you've already probably changed a few things uh, as we've gone through this, but you know, we continue to learn more. Um, this is an evolving story. Uh, many of us have been watching uh, the uh, expansion of the Delta variant across the country and in our communities. And again, I'd wanna just share that uh, it's the spirit of how do we protect our workforce, particularly around all respiratory illnesses that are transmissible. So in this first exhibit, I do wanna share that these are a really a kind of a construct, if you will, a framework in which we want you to consider uh, that are situational, perhaps related to your workforce, your workplace, and the environment that you conduct business. And in this framework, you may have seen this in the past, but there's an addition, and that's the upper left side, the susceptibility piece, recognizing that, you know, we know that not everyone has equal risk to acquire affection. We've learned through the pandemic, for example, those with co-occurring conditions are more likely to have severe illness. And that's true, by the way, for influenza as well. We also know that there's been variable uptake in immunization. Uh, we've seen that across the country. We see vaccine coverage rates have varied between, say, 40% and as high as 60 or 65%. Um, and that's for COVID. And when we come to influenza season, we know that that's very variable as well. So I want you to keep in mind the unique characteristics of your workforce, perhaps what their risks are, including those who might have immunocompromised conditions that might put them at additional risk over time, particularly if we see the uh, uh, sort of development of, of more uh, um, virulent, if you will, more transmissive, um, transmissible variants of COVID. We've seen that with Delta. And I think that, that you know, time will tell how well the current vaccines are able to protect us. Um, some of these other characteristics, if you will, situational characteristics, I think you're familiar with where we are in time and place, the proximity to each other. But one area I wanna call out is airflow, right? This is one that I don't think we've talked about quite as much in the past. Something to be thinking about. For many of you who work in certain industries, this is something that is top of mind, but we want to mitigate or minimize the opportunity to be breathing each other's air, right? We want to really make sure that our HVAC systems are well-tuned, that we have proper air exchange and good filtration in terms of air and air conditioning and heating 
filters. Uh, the last point I want to call out is congestion. Um, obviously, you know, this really speaks to how close we are to each other. Maybe it's coworkers, maybe it's patrons, people that we really don't know what risk they might bring into our workplace. And thinking about that reminds me to mention that, you know, the recent change in guidance by the CDC related to indoor mask for, uh, use uh, in the areas of high transmission of the Delta variant was really a change. It was, it was true that people who have not been immunized were requested to wear masks and maintain that physical distancing, but now there's this additional recommendation for this highly transmissible variant for those who've been fully vaccinated, particularly in congested areas indoors with high transmission rates to wear a mask. So again, just kind of have, think about those uh, elements, if you will, as they relate to your workforce. So I do want to talk a little bit about these four general key areas of themes, recommendations that are contained with both OSHA guidance and the CDC guidance to prevent the transmission of COVID and other respiratory illnesses. And really these fall into these areas. Uh, first one around health checks is really about how do we prevent inadvertent exposure. Somebody who is ill, we don't want them to expose a coworker or a patron or an organization. The second around testing is finding out who's sick, right? Confirming a diagnosis, right? Once we know, say we're infected, what do we do? Well, we need to, you know, isolate, right? In the case of COVID-19, but the same would be true with like rapid flu testing as well when we get to flu season. Uh, so it's important to be able to identify those who are infectious in a timely manner so action can be taken. And then in the action part, this is how do we mitigate or minimize the likelihood that transmission is going to occur. And again, there's a range of actions that might be appropriate to put into place, or maybe you've put some of these into place, but maybe not, um, maybe they haven't been as enforced, or perhaps there's an opportunity to regroup and maybe change the focus. All the while, by the way, maintaining confidentiality across Across the workplace, particularly, you know, with that uh, privacy rule in place as well. And then the last part is how do we bolster up confidence? Confidence among the coworkers that I or you or any of any of us know what to do. What's the proper appropriate hygiene practice? How do I wear a mask if that's indicated? What are steps I can take to um, clearly and and effectively communicate what might be the policy in the workplace. So I just wanted to put these up. Of course, there's a couple references there. I encourage you to go check them out because there's loads more information for you to review and consider as we are going to be successful in this re-entry or continued work through this period of time, which we're all defining and we're seeing unfold uh, in front of us. I think the fall will be an interesting time. We've got kids going back to school. We have the typical viruses that start to show up in the fall. and We want to be ready. I, I know we will be ready. So on the next slide, I've listed a couple key activities that promote workforce health and prevent the transmission of respiratory illnesses. Mm -hmm. um, the first one I want to highlight, and that's that many of you have had on-site flu clinics in the past. Well, this year, we want to say that most of our providers have recognized the need to expand what's offered in those clinics. That would include things like flu shots, of course, COVID vaccine, and some of the other recommended immunizations. And that might include the DTAP, which would be for pertussis prevention, or even the uh, streptococcal vaccine to prevent pneumonia. There are other vaccines that may be offered up uh, on those on-site vaccine clinics. I want to also, again, mention that people who are sick should be able to stay home and get well. So this is where take a look at your leave policy. Uh, make sure it's not punitive. Make sure it's supportive. And I do understand through the American Rescue Act that there are potential tax credits that are available for businesses with 500 employees or less. So important to rethink that, recognizing, of course, you want to make sure that your operation are not compromised, but we don't want to have the whole outfit be infected uh, because someone is coming to work sick. And then uh, again, something to mention, uh, air filtration and ventilation. You know, it's a very interesting area that I think, again, it really demands us to take a look. What's it like? Are we, are we replacing uh, the air with fresh air? How many times an hour does that happen? And in preparation for our call today, I did a little, you know, research on, you know, what is typical in an airplane, apparently air is refreshed about 20 to 30 times an hour. 
in an indoor space like your home, it might be about six to eight times an hour, but in a it's more of a uh, industrial space or commercial space, the expectation it's about 10 to 20 times an hour. So it's an opportunity to maybe check in with your, your physical plant colleagues and, and figure out, you know, how are we doing there? And of course, that has other benefits in filtering out pathogens and mold and dust and other things that could cause a little irritation in that respiratory tract. And then finally, encouraging follow-up for health conditions. So many of us may have postponed care this past year, maybe skipped a screening test or a cancer screen, uh, maybe didn't even follow up on a routine medical for a chronic illness. Think about putting in a health day, uh, encouraging the workforce to get in, get back in the saddle, make sure that their underlying health conditions are addressed. That's a critical piece, not only for the prevention of, of more severe respiratory illness, should they become infected, but overall their long-term health and longevity. And then this last slide I do want to share with you, these were data that came from the Census Bureau's Household Pulse Survey to see how were different populations impacted through the pandemic. And I highlight some of these categories for you because these represent members that may be on your workforce, perhaps are people that you serve in your organization. And just keep in mind that this is where an ongoing dialogue with your your employees, figuring out how they're managing. Many employees are really looking to see how employers are managing the return to work decisions, how they're being supported in the workplace, how much and how they can access some of the behavioral health support that has become legion through this time. One of the biggest indicators of, of, of determining whether or not you, what you put in place is effective is what the disease burden is in the workforce, right? If you're starting to see lots of people who've become infected or an ongoing sort of smoldering, continuing uh, sort of illness, if you will, I think that's a very objective indicator that we need to rethink and maybe put in bolster up, if you will, interventions that we know will mitigate transmission of respiratory pathogens. And I fully recognize that, you know, some of this is about culture, right? Uh, as employers, you know, you do have the prerogative prerogative to determine what's the right decision for your workforce, your workplace, your industry, your customers. And we want to make sure that, you know, people are safe. They feel supported. Uh, customers or patrons that are accessing your business don't feel frightened or threatened or feel like they might get sick. And so I think that this will vary, again, depending on the industry and depending on the burden of disease and the culture of your organization. And as you all seen in many healthcare settings, vaccines have now become mandatory. Now, that might not be the right thing for you all, but you know what? It will, it'll run the gamut depending, again, on what's appropriate. Thank you. Today, I would like to start by defining what burnout is and, as importantly, what it is not. Burnout is a syndrome resulting from chronic workplace stress, and it usually manifests as physical, mental, and emotional exhaustion uh, with feelings of um, cynicism or, or negativism in the workplace and a sense of reduced fulfillment and accomplishment in the workplace. I want to highlight a couple of aspects of this definition. One, that burnout is defined as a syndrome, not a disease. It is a collection of symptoms, and that uh, burnout is a workplace-specific syndrome. That means that, you know, we can talk about different types of stressors that folks are going through, but when we are using the term burnout, it is usually reserved for workplace stress. Now, burnout often occurs when there are high job demands that are accompanied by a lack or limited job resources, regardless of the type of job. A couple of other important aspects of the definition to keep in mind is that burnout is a chronic syndrome in the sense that it doesn't spring up overnight. Um, it develops over a period of weeks or months. Burnout is a serious syndrome. Left untreated, it can lead to the development of serious mental health conditions like anxiety, depression, or panic attacks, or alcohol use, drug use. It's also associated with significant physical changes, oftentimes significant weight gain or weight loss, um, severe muscle, ten muscle tension, and burnout is actually considered a risk factor for different heart diseases as well as high blood pressure and diabetes. Burnout is highly prevalent, and yet still very significantly stigmatized. So looking at some numbers from the Gallup survey from 2020, it shows that three quarters of employees reported experiencing burnout at least sometimes. And yet, despite you know, the high prevalence, up to 80% of workers said there was shame and stigma that prevented them from seeking support. 
And more than 40% of employees actually expressed concerns about retaliation if they were to seek care or support in this context. Now, why is burnout or talking about burnout so important? Um, it's because it, it can have such a profound impact both on the employee and the employer. From the employees end, burnout can manifest with significant physical symptoms. We're talking about, you know, muscle tension, headaches, trouble sleeping, poor sleep quality, a sense of fatigue, like you're kind of dragging, a lot of gastrointestinal symptoms as well. From a um, kind of emotional, mental symptom perspective, there is a significant irritability, a sense of numbness, uh, a sense of cynicism or negativity, uh, detachment from the workplace, difficulty concentrating, and a lack of uh, fulfillment and satisfaction with one's job or with one's performance. And as we saw earlier, it can be associated as well with serious physical and mental health conditions. Now, this impacts employers and the workplace because employees struggling with burnout really are significantly more likely to take sick days or be absent from, from the workplace. They're more likely to be seeking different jobs, as in looking to, to change jobs, and they tend to be less confident about their performance and the quality of work that they're doing. And this impacts productivity and the quality of work, of course. There is a sense of fatigue, the disorganization, absenteeism, staff turnover, and overall negative workplace attitude all kind of leads to productivity and, and quality issues at work. But generally speaking, burnout is caused by a combination of high job demands combined with um, lack of job resources or limited job resources. And under that, we, you know, we have work-life imbalance. At times, other factors include dysfunctional work environment. One very commonly cited cause for burnout is having unclear job expectations or receiving missed messages at times due to unclear communication from managers. Another uh, common, common cause for burnout is that sense of lack of control or helplessness over one's work demands and combined with the support in the workplace. The one area I want to stand on just a bit is that it's often assumed that burnout is caused primarily by working longer hours. And this is true to some extent. Now, the common wisdom previously was that, okay, one is having burnout or struggling with burnout, you recover by either working fewer hours or taking a day off here or there, taking vacation. But the reality is the number of hours people work each week does matter in the sense that burnout risk increases significantly when employees exceed 50 hours a week. But it's more how one experiences their workload and workplace that has a stronger influence on burnout than the number of hours worked on, you know, on its own. So, so in fact, engaged employees who feel supported in the workplace and who have job flexibility tend to work longer hours be more productive and at the same time report higher well-being. So burnout is, is about that relationship between number of hours worked, the efforts put into the work, considered in the context of whether the employee feels supported or not, or uh, feel, feeling appreciated or not, and having the resources to do their work. And it's so important to be aware of all of these causes because when just as an example, when employees feel that they are um, treated unfairly in the workplace, they are two and a half times more likely to experience burnout. Again, that's as per the Gallup Workplace Survey from 2020. Now, um, let, next, let's talk about preventing and managing burnout. Um, and that, of course, falls under um, the promotion of well-being in the workplace. So that's very, very important because the number one most important thing that we can start with is creating a workplace culture that promotes well-being. See, when an organization makes well-being a priority in its culture and provides resources for employees um, to, to do their work and to live healthier lives, they take better care of themselves, they support each other, and kind of model this healthier behavior and a healthier work-life balance across the workplace. In contrast, when well-being is, is thought of or, or perceived as a series of one-off initiatives rather than a lived value, that can actually backfire and cause more cynicism and, and burnout. That's because the hard work that HR would into promoting wellness can at times be interpreted as out of sync with the ways that the business is conducted. So it's important to actually really make wellness and well-being part of the culture and, and really a lived value uh, within the workplace. 
Next, it's important to recognize the impact of chronic uh, stress. And, and let's just take the past 18 months as an example. We've been dealing, as Dr. Khan had clearly <laughs> talked about earlier, with perpetual change, um, perpetual uncertainty that have become a staple of our lives. And it's not just the pandemic, it's, it's the economic stressors, the psychosocial stressors, and all the changes that have taken collective toll on our um, health and emotional well-being. So this is the time to offer your employees support and flexibility and help them manage all of these changes. And one area that I can't emphasize this enough is so important to communicate any anticipated changes, any anticipated new expectations or plans very clearly to employees and to try to be as transparent as possible to avoid confusion and mitigate frustrations and, and frankly, to, to demonstrate that you have your employees in mind as you are planning uh, the next stages in any kind of evolution in, in the workplace. Next, it's important to destigmatize conversations on mental health and well-being. See, employers and managers play a, a critical role in setting the tone of how well-being is discussed or viewed in the workplace. And given the stigma that still exists, if a company's culture doesn't embrace wellness and openness on mental health issues and mental well-being, there's so much fear and shame that can prevent folks from actually reaching out for support. And managers can support employees by destigmatizing these conversations, um, creating a safe environment to talk about mental health and well-being, listening without judgment, and really provide, uh, providing support when support is needed. It's important to actively look out and observe for signs of, and symptoms of burnout. I, I recognize this is much harder when employees are working remotely, but not just when working remotely. It's just historically something that maybe many managers have not looked at in the workplace. So spotting the early signs of, of burnout can, can sometimes be difficult, but it's so important to try to look for these signs and symptoms um, to try to address them as soon as possible. Um, and finally, provide support when needed. And it's important to catch burnout earlier because, you know, untreated, unattended to, uh, unsupported, it can become a serious condition. So if you suspect that your employee might be struggling with burnout, uh, there are several sec steps to take to improve the situation. Listen in a way that's non-judgmental and um, in an empathic manner. Try to understand the factors contributing to the burnout and to modify these factors. There are usually factors on the workplace and at times on the employee end. So try to modify the workplace factors contributing to, to burnout. Uh, when it comes to the employee themselves, it's important to, uh, to address their needs and understand what they're struggling through. And keep in mind that support takes different, different forms. Uh, for the employee, it could be an emphasis on practicing self-care, such as um, exercise, engaging in hobbies, or strengthening their social support network, reconnecting with friends. Um, it could be using self-navigated tools. These are digital tools that typically uh, on, on helping with resilience and stress management. Could be seeking support from uh, employee assistance programs. And for more serious conditions, it, like depression or anxiety, it might, it might be time to seek more professional help. And again, that can take different forms depending on the needs of your employee. It, it could be reaching out to their primary care physician or a behavioral health professional. Finally, I'd say it's important to remind employees to consider seeking out support through your health plan. See, we offer a wide range of services and solutions that span the behavioral health spectrum, including these self-guided digital tools, in, including in-person care, telehealth solutions, psychotherapy, medication management, as well as higher levels of care intensity for more severe conditions. So keep that in mind as well. People show signs and symptoms of burnout differently, and they might react to certain stressors that might affect them more than might affect other folks. And so it's important to understand the factors contributing to burnout. And based on this understanding, can develop a plan to address burnout, to be it kind of workplace dynamic, fusion about communication, number of hours, or issues with flexibility and having other issues in one's personal life that might be impacting their ability to perform at work. And based on deeper understanding of what's going Going on, there are issues that can be addressed in the workplace, then issues that can be addressed to support the employee. Thanks for, for having me. We successfully enabled our employees to transition from our offices across the four states um, to home in early 2020 at the start of a pandemic. 
and it worked really well. Um, now, when I compare kind of the pandemic work environment to the pre-pandemic one, I would say it compares a house and a tent. So we had a really strong foundation and brought people uh, back in a very a swift way into almost a, a tent kind of uh, situation. And it worked well for 15, 18 months. And what we're now trying to do, what we're building is that future ho home that is not a tent, but a solid home. I would say before the April 2020 timeframe, pre-pandemic, we had about half of our employees working from one of our offices and half of our employees working from home. But the way we worked was heavily focused on an on in-office experience. We had a very a vibrant culture if you walk through our offices and we want to bring that back into the um, future workspace once we open our offices. On the other hand, employees who worked not in our offices, they sometimes shared it's more difficult to feel the same level of connection and engagement compared to their um, colleagues who are on site. In early 2020, when we asked um, our employees to work from home, it's been tough on many levels. But on the positive side, employees told us that they really felt that the conversations were more real, less hierarchical. It didn't matter whether they had a corner office or not. You just um, jumped on Teams call together. And they also flagged that they felt they like the flexibility of being uh, remote, working from home. So we want to keep that flexibility. So when we built the future workplace, we are taking a very human-centered approach tailored to the employees' roles needs their individual preferences and to accommodate for that ask of flexibility. Here on this slide, can you, you can see our four working models, which is new to our employees. From the left to the right, you can see a decrease in on-site and in-office time. So on the far left, we have a colleague who works um, fully on-site at can be an office. On the right, there is a telecommuter who works fully remote. And in the middle, there are the two hybrid models. So they're working partly on-site, partly from home. Um, the on-site flex employee about half the time, half, half, the teleflex employee will be on-site only for a few days per month. And each of these models will come with certain benefits, for example, allowances on home office setup, IT equipment, transportation benefits. And we really made sure that based uh, compared to my earlier, earlier comments that people feel like there's an equality between these different working models. So what we did is in partnership with our business leaders, the project team made a recommendation for each employee, for each role, what the recommended business uh, working model is. Um, and we also linked it to, to a very fundamental question. Why should people going forward come to the office? What, they, what are they, they supposed to do? And we've never been that purposeful about that beforehand. Once we finished these initial recommendation, we trained our managers to have a conversation with each employee, not only about the facts, but listen with intent. So, and to, to listen and explain what the recommendation was. Good news, about 80% of the um, employees agreed with the working model, about, about I think 15 to 18% said, I wanna have a change. And we're actually approved 99% of the changes um, because we wanna, um, one, um, make sure that employees know that they have an input in that. And that's a, that's a requirement that employees have, an expectation that they have. And two, that we as employer communicate and deliver on the promise, we're in this with you and wherever we can, we accommodate what you need. And I just want to iterate what Dr. Khan said. What we also learned is agility. And we will continue to do so as we learn more about Delta and many other things. We want to thank all of our presenters today, as well as Regents, for their expertise and for allowing us to share this information with you all. Thank you for joining us and make sure to join us at 2 o'clock for our presentation on creating an attractive workplace. And don't forget to RSVP for next week's sessions on financial well-being and all about the hive.